we have not fully matured what in, what online learning really looks like right now. I think we're in some form of metamorphosis, clearly. But if you ask me if we're there yet, I don't think so. I think we're going to do better at at mastery-based learning, you know, competency-based learning, where students are going to be able to demonstrate competency and not have to do. If I understood the Silk Road and how it, you know, affected Columbus and South America and all of that, maybe I don't need to learn it again. But if I don't understand it, I do need to learn it again. So I like the idea of where we're going with more individualized learning. I think my grandchildren will learn differently than I did clearly, and they will clearly learn differently than my boys did too. And I think that's exciting, and I'm excited to be part of that. I'm Nikki Herda, and this is Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms, a podcast where we celebrate our state's educators and explore the future of learning. It's no secret to say that online learning has changed a lot in the past couple of decades. After all, at the turn of the century, online courses were still being distributed on CD-ROMs. As technology evolves, the possibilities it offers to educators expand in kind. No longer does every student need to receive the same education as the rest of their peers. No longer are they required to learn at the same pace, in the same place, or at the same time. In today's episode, I chat with Christy Peacock, a course development manager for Michigan Virtual, who has years of experience designing online courses for K-12 students, as well as for educators taking online professional development courses. Christy and I talk about what it means to be an instructional designer, what advice she has for educators designing their own online learning experiences for students, and what she hopes the future will hold for this ever-evolving sector of education. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Christy, for this episode of Bright. Um, to get us started, I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what is it that drew you to education in the first place? And how did that journey evolve to lead you where you are today? I think, to be honest, the biggest thing is, is that uh, if you looked up lifelong learner in the dictionary, you'd find out that I'm very much that person. I love to learn new things. And it just made sense to me that I, on learning new things, I like to share them. And I think that made me just the epitome of what a teacher is. And I'm enthusiastic about learning new things. And I think that's contagious for students. And I've worked, I've taught elementary. Mario teaches typing to kindergarten students. And I have taught at the community college level and everything in between including gifted and talented and alternative ed and I can tell you the my biggest asset ever when it came to teaching is that I love to learn and my, that enthusiasm just spread to students. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I love hearing what drew people to education. So. Well and the um, journey to getting here at Michigan Virtual was kind of interesting actually. Uh, my, high, my husband is a, uh, was a public school administrator. Hmm. And as in a lot of these smaller rural districts. So what happened is, is I, I think most people who know much about public school administration realize that you move around a bit. And I got really tired of setting up classrooms, taking down classrooms, starting new a new career every time we moved. And I'm very broadly certified, so I'm certified in so all the sciences and computer science. So when we would move, what would happen is, is in one district I might be teaching chemistry, and then the next district I'd be teaching eighth grade physical science or environmental science. And so it was always this big mind shift. And so I decided, honestly, when I was at Tequamanon Area Schools, I was a mentor teacher for all the students teaching, taking Michigan virtual courses. That was back right around 2001. And so 
I said then, when I saw our kids getting to take courses like a German course because they were interested in German, it was their heritage, or we had students, that, we had a course back then that was called the Introduction to Logic, and um, I saw kids taking that, and I thought, wow, I don't know what this Michigan virtual thing is, but I, I love this because it's leveling the playing field for students regardless of their socioeconomic background and their geography and that was really exciting to me and I said to my husband then you know that's something I could get behind and then the next time we moved there was actually a physics job posting and I applied I didn't get the physics job but I did get AP computer science and so I started as a contracted teacher teaching computer science for Michigan Virtual and then, of course, when they posted the full-time jobs, I became the full-time full -time science teacher. So I was one of the four full-time teachers for Michigan Virtual. And then I was no longer working on a contract basis. And I loved that. But what happened is, is and it's kind of David Young's fault, but I don't know if you can put that in your video or not, but it's honestly David Young's fault because I was working with him quite a bit um, as full-time teachers. We worked kind of hand-in-hand with IPD to make improvements to some of the courses that we were teaching, and so I had started working with him back and forth, and he said to me, yeah, I was a teacher too, but I found I could make a bigger impact as an instructional designer. I'm like, well, explain to me how that works. And he said, well, as an instructional designer, I'm building courses that can affect lots of kids, where as a teacher, you can only affect the ones in your courses. So you can only guess what happened. That rang in my head for a long time. And the next time an ID job opened, I applied. And I got it. And so I've been in instructional design ever since. And... I just absolutely love the creative part of what I do. So is that why you like being an instructional designer? Are there any other reasons you'd like to share that like you just really love it? I love I love the creativity part of it and I love the sense that I'm having a big impact. I like working with with other teachers and subject matter experts. We contract most of those. We don't actually have them on staff, but I have met some of the smartest people that I've ever met in my life. When we contract these people, I mean, they're truly experts in their field, and it's really fun. One of my first courses, that, actually about the first four courses that I ever built with Michigan Virtual were social studies courses. Social studies is about as far from my bivouac as you can get. and. That and I taught, I built German courses. I built that whole first two year, four semesters of German. And I can tell you that German was my lowest grade of my entire college career. I thought they made a big mistake. But the good part about that, if you, if you flip the table on that, there were times I caught them as, as experts talking over my head. And I could say, wait a minute. I understand the Silk Road. We just talked about that in the last lesson, and I understand that. But now we're talking about South America and, and Columbus, and, like, I can't tie these two things together. And he's like, oh, you're right. I should probably put a paragraph in this lesson that does that. Well, yeah, because somebody like me doesn't get that, and then our students benefit from that, too. So I think learning this has just been the perfect place for someone who just loves to learn new things I, I i like that i really do um okay so you were both you've been an online instructor and a face-to-face -face teacher and uh now are an instructional designer so i'm curious if you could talk to me a little bit about um what your experience was shifting from being an online teacher to an online course designer and kind of what that balance is between those two roles, you know, the, with the instructor designing the course and the teacher teaching it. When I was teaching online, I liked coaching students because I felt like that's more what I was doing because the content was provided for me 
and the assessments were provided for me, I felt like my role in that was being available, coaching the students through the experiences in the online way. I wasn't developing them. So the difference between what I was doing in an online setting versus what I was doing in a face-to-face -face setting, I had to go home every night and have my next day all prepared. So whether it was I had one prep or five preps, I had to have something to lead the students through the next day, something to engage them in their learning. And with Michigan Virtual and an online education, that was provided for me, but it was me then as the coach that had to prompt them and use feedback and reach out to them if they weren't doing their work or if, allow them another try at something after an explanation. So it was, I felt like I was more in a coaching role as an online teacher than I, I was a coach in a face to face, but I also, and for lack of a better words, I had to have some kind of a dog and pony show every day. And I didn't have to have a dog and pony show every day in an online so I could really focus on what the students were doing on their assessments, whether they were keeping up, whether I could tell that they just missed the target just a little bit. And what can I say to the student? What can I provide for the student to get them over the hump to really understand this concept? So I think those were the things. When I was teaching computer science, I taught the AP course, which is primarily a Java programming course, and I knew that 90% of my students are better, had no one else in their life, in their personal world, that could help them fix their program when it, when it didn't run. So it was all me. There was no, well, I can just go to my English teacher and she'll show me how to write this. There was no other person more than likely in their world that could write Java code. So it, it really made me aware how, much, how dependent on me and my feedback they were. And I think that's just knowing that and that ability to coach them through it helped them and I both be successful. And I know like a lot of our online teachers modify their courses, you know, and like yep. kind of create some of their own kind of side content or something, you yep. know, to differentiate maybe for students. Um, but, you know, they don't have to do it all on their own, like you said, every night for the next day. No, which is no I think that's what, what keeps me here too right now that really fascinates me about moving forward in instructional design because this is, we have not fully matured what in, what online learning really looks like right now. I think we're in some form of metamorphosis clearly to move from the online to or from the face to face to the online world. But if you ask me if we're there yet, I don't think so. I think we're going to do better at at mastery based learning where we're going to you know competency based learning where students are going to be able to demonstrate competency and not have to do if i understood the silk road and how it you know affected columbus and south america and all of that maybe i don't need to learn it again but if i don't understand it i do need to learn it again so I like the idea of where we're going with more individualized learning. I think my grandchildren will learn differently than I did clearly, and they will clearly learn differently than my boys did too. And I think that's exciting, and I'm excited to be part of that. I think you'll see us doing more package-based content, you know, concept packages instead of, full year courses. I mean, there's still going to be a need for full year courses, but wouldn't it be cool if we could distribute them in blocks so that students were getting what they need, but not getting what they already know? That was one of the better explanations of competency-based learning I've heard, and I'm here for it. I personally love the idea of competency-based learning versus based on students' chronicle age. We have to stop working with 
every fifth grader be, should be here and every 15 year old should be here because that's not how it is. Why is that not how it is? Because students are all different places. I, I, I feel like I used to work, I was a quality control technician for Pepsi years ago, back when we you used to get the glass bottles. I was the quality control person in one of the glass plants. And every time they would bring us new glass, one of my jobs was to assess the quality of the bottles that came in. And I could go, yeah, this one has bubbles, chuck. I could go, this one's too, you know, I could get my calipers out, break the bottle, caliper the bottle, too thin, junk. We don't do that in public schools. Every student comes in our doors in a different place. And we can't go, junk, not that we would want to if we could. We have to take them from where they are when they walk in their, our doors and not tell them that they're behind. They're not behind because to them, they're right where they're supposed to be. So let's take them from where they are and move them forward. And I think competency-based learning and individualized instruction is is a key to that. I think I, I worked in alternative ed, and honestly, those students, some of them, they're really not, they're not behind. They just have so many other distractions in their lives that this isn't their primary focus every day. And we have to take them from where they are. That We can't let them feel like they're junk and that we should throw them. That they're not. In fact, some of them are more, you know, more intelligent in other ways. I've, I've had students, alternative ed students, show up and say, let me show you how to take a carburetor out of a snowmobile. I have, literally. I, you could open that snowmobile and ask me to find the carburetor, and that'd be task enough because I'm pretty sure I'd epic fail. Some of these kids have different intelligences. They're diff The same kid who wanted to show me how to take a carburetor apart couldn't read probably more than the third grade level. But it's it doesn't mean they're dumb. It doesn't mean they're behind. It just means that they're not at the place we expect them to be right at this moment. So this past year, many teachers across the nation acted as impromptu instructional designers for their own online courses. So I've heard this described as learning how to build the plane and fly it at the same time. Uh, this was understandably a challenging experience for many. And I was just wondering, you know, as an instructional designer, if you have any um, thoughts or reflections you'd like to share um, on this experience that many teachers had. That's funny because I had a lot of office hours over this time where I was working as an instructional designer with teachers in the field trying to do this. And my first every time response was, what you're being asked to do is literally impossible. So right now you have to stop beating yourself up. You can't beat yourself. You are doing your very best. But the truth of it is, when I, as an instructional designer, who have built lots and lots and lots and lots of courses, build a course right now. So right now I'm working on a year-long AP Computer Science Principles course. One semester of that takes me about three months to build. I could not, I am experienced instructional designer. Three weeks before school starts, you have four preps, five preps, and you're tasked with putting all of that online in three weeks? That, that's, it's not even doable. So whatever you did, whatever you accomplished to the best of your abilities, is is a success. If you made it through this year, you know, building that plane and flying that plane at the same time, pat, pat yourself on the back and say, I made it through that. I brought students along. Was it perfect? No. But nothing about COVID has been perfect. And I think that that part of it is, is don't be hard on yourself because what you were asked to do was a very, very, very large task. 
I'm Nikki Herta, and you're listening to Bright, a podcast that is made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Today, I'm chatting with Christy Peacock, a course development manager for Michigan Virtual. Up next, I asked Christy to share her tips for designing engaging and accessible online learning experiences for students. So I know we can't possibly capture the full breadth of your um, your expertise and your experience in just a few short minutes, but I was wondering if you could just give us like a little glimpse into you know some of your top tips um, on instructional design. What have you learned is most important when designing engaging online content for students? Engaging? It's easy because I don't think I've ever grown up, so it's easy to think like a student and. I think my experience in face-to-face teaching and online teaching, when I rolled over into um, instructional design, I kind of had a feeling for what engages students and and challenges and I, experiences. I'm kind of I kind of love project-based learning. Um, I like I like to learn by doing and touching. Although I love to read, I know that I can engage students more if it's not just words on a page. So I think one of my favorite things to do is build storyline interactions. So I built a whole bunch of them for forensic science. And, of course, I usually memorialize everybody I know. So now I'm going to need a character somewhere named Nikki in one of my, my little animations that I like to build. So I what um what tool do you use for that? I use Articulate Storyline a lot to do that. Um I did I have built courses where I've used Powtoons. And can you uh describe just in case somebody doesn't know, so what exactly is a storyline interaction and um what does it look like in an online course? Well they can be animations, they can have realistic pictures, but they actually allow students to interact with the content. So I'm working on AP Physics C labs right now. So we're doing one on rotational motion. And it's kind of a, the plot is that this character is a secret agent. And there's like terrorists or bad guys that have infiltrated a warehouse and up on the hill beside the warehouse is a non-functional antenna that rotates. Well, this is in the rotational motion um, lesson in the AP Computer Science C. So we're going to, there's actually a fan on the top of the factory. So our special agent has got to lower himself down into the fan at just the right moment so that he's between in the opening of the blades so that he can get down and he's going to anchor his rope to this rotating antenna in order to let himself go and they have to figure out you know the period of the fan for how many seconds is it open and exactly when they have to drop in order to hit that at the right time and so they're given a lot of data, but then they have to use the data. That's so neat. So I think it, it's kind of fun. I'm not done with it, but I'm we're making progress right now. But I love to build those kind of things to engage kids' creative side and thinking and use, actually using the data. It's one of the reasons I've always liked physics. I always tell kids, physics isn't hard. It's just math with a purpose. Instead of doing a hundred problems on a sheet of paper, figure something out with it. It's like a story problem, you know, like Mm -hmm. you did in school, except for it's like brought to life, you know, and it's like animated. That's so cool. That's, that's a good way to do it. Story problems Mm -hmm. brought to life. Uh, Same question, same context of, you know, let's give us your best tips or you just, your, distill your wisdom for us. But this time on uh, designing accessible online experiences for students. So what do you, have you found is most important in this area? Oh, I, this is a topic I'm really passionate about. So when I came to work for Michigan Virtual, I told you this earlier in the interview, 
I really drank the purple Kool-Aid on Michigan Virtual when it was about every student had access to the courses that we're building. So every student in the state of Michigan had access to German, had introduction to logic, and could do all these. And I was just like, this is fantastic. But what we really have to jump to next is every student also includes those that have differing abilities, cognitive abilities, visual abilities, hearing abilities, all of the tactile abilities. Um, not every student's disability is obvious when you look at them, just like every person. And I think it's really important as an instructional designer to think of them at the beginning of building a project. And, and, I, and I tried to tell teachers that, that, that worked in the office hours with me this year. As you're putting your content online, think about the fonts that you're using. If you're putting a video on, does it have a transcript? If it doesn't, let's find a way to get one. When we make courses usable for all students, we make the best learning opportunity for every student. Whether they have differing abilities or they don't have differing abilities, think about it this way. If it, here at Taquaman and Area Schools, we have the largest school district this side of the Mississippi. So when I sit in class, if you and I are classmates in a math class and we're sitting next to each other, conceivably you live 80 miles from me. Because our busing system, our geographic area is huge. So it's super, super important that we understand that a lot of our students spend a lot of time in a car and on a bus. If that bus is noisy, but I want to do my lesson on the way home, if it has a transcript on it, I can do it. So it's not just the student that can't hear because of a physical issue. It's they can't hear because there's too many people on the bus. We also know there's a statistic in, in Michigan about the number of our students that are being parented by their grandparents. How do we know what grandma and grandpa can hear? Even though it's not necessarily, you can look at me and say, I got 30 kids in my class, they all hear just fine, they all see just fine, let's just build something. But you don't know who's helping them. You don't know who else is in the picture. So I think those types of things are really important to think through and not make assumptions about. So a, just, honestly, as you start designing something, make the assumption that you have students that don't hear well. You have students that don't see well. You have students that tactically moving this mouse around all day long is exhausting or impossible. So make those kinds of assumptions when you build your course. And number one, you don't have to go back and fix it later when that does happen to you. But you're also making sure that every one of those students has the best opportunity for success. Thank you. All right. We got a few more if you have uh, time. Sure. So can you tell me about your favorite teacher and why they were your favorite? You know, I've had a lot of favorite teachers over the years because I happen to be a school nerd. You know, I'm one of those people who loved school because I love to learn new things. But I think I would have to say the common denominator of the teachers that, that I found were my favorites, they were, they, they didn't raise their voice ever. They demanded and challenged me. But they didn't demand and challenge me without giving me what I needed, the explanation. They were patient because not everybody gets it the first time. And so those are some of the co common threads. Patient, willing to let me take it where I wanted to take it instead of just saying, well, it ends like this, you got it, move. But if I thought I needed to learn more or I wanted to engage more, they gave me more opportunities to engage with it. Um, those were the type of teachers that meant a lot who, and teachers who believed in me. Yes, those are definitely answers I've heard echoed across like the different interviews, like 
particularly like, you know, they challenged me, but they gave me the tools, you know, and yep. it's been really cool to hear different answers from different people on that. I love it. I'd like to hear about your vision for student learning. And so the way I break that down is if it were up to you, what would you really want to see for every single student? I would want us to think about how we can meet students where they are instead of this chronological moving us forward. You didn't make the mark, so you don't get to move forward. Uh, taking students as what they are and who they are when they when they come into our school regardless of their chronological age move students through their education based on their mastery of topics and not some birthday somewhere along that i'm supposed to have met those targets because i'm a certain age and not accounting for the differences in who they are as people and the experiences and assets that they came to us with or did not come to us with. And what would you say is the role of technology in that vision? I think it gives us the ability to, to, to personalize learning, to figure out where students are. When we can build software that can remediate I was the type of person who really has to reflect, and I know a lot of my students are. So when you show me one time how to do this this calculus problem on the on the whiteboard, and then I have to pack up my stuff and go home, I can't replay that in my head. So having the technology to start and stop that that presentation, this is how you do it. I can get to that part and go, oh, pause, do this. Don't I, I? I'm a Googler. I'm a you. I'm a YouTube Googler. So if I need to learn something new, um, I hope my son put new window motors in his car one time because they were really expensive to have somebody else do it. But we could buy them cheap on Amazon, and we watched. I sat with the laptop as we took apart the car door and followed it step by step. But we didn't catch it all the first time. So if someone would have just done a demonstration for us and gone, this is how you do it, and just did it, we might have got pieces and parts of it. But the idea that we could replay that video and see it over again, ah, how did he get that rivet out of there? You could go back and do it. So for me, a big piece of technology in education will be providing students with an opportunity to learn content at their own pace, replaying and starting over and going back tomorrow, if I don't remember it, to watch it again. Because I can tell you what, when we did one door window motor, we had to play it all over again to do the second one. Even though we had a better idea of what we're doing, that first time was not enough to make us proficient to do it the second time. It was going to take more than that. I haven't done any more window motors for, since that day, but I can tell you that I couldn't do it again right now without going back to that video. So the idea that technology could provide opportunity for repetition for students would be huge. Awesome. What words of advice or encouragement would you offer educators right now? Stay to, true to who you are. If you're truly a lifelong learner, and I know a lot of my fellow educators are, we love to learn, that's why we're here, and we hope to teach others. Hold on to that enthusiasm that you had when you first got into teaching. Don't get down on yourself or others. Um, keep learning and keep don't be afraid to tell students what you're learning about and what you're reading about and your successes and failures at, at learning to do something new. I, I just, I live on a lake, so I just decided I was tired. My husband always going into town to buy worms to go fishing. I said, that's dumb. We should build a worm farm. <laughs> so I did some studying and I built my worm farm. And I tried to follow all the rules uh, that I learned on YouTube. I watched several. But when you go away for the weekend and your garage heats up to 80 degrees or whatever it was, the worm didn't do so good. So I made a mistake. But I'm willing to say I tried. 
I swung and missed. So I'm going to do it again, but now I'm going to put them in the basement because it's cold down there. There's no sunshine going to get them down there. So I'm, I think it's okay to let students know when we fail. And when you're trying to learn something new and you didn't do it perfect the first time, I always tried to tell students we're going to learn this together. I don't know all the answers. You can't be afraid to start at the beginning even if you're older. It's okay. If you don't know something, seek out people who do. I think don't be afraid to let your students know you're a lifelong learner. And don't stop being a lifelong learner. Model that for them and your enthusiasm for learning will be contagious. Christy posits a beautiful vision for the future of student learning, one in which the unique unfolding of each child's learning journey is honored through a competency-based progression. Just because a child is 10 years old, she reminds us, doesn't mean that they are or should be at the same place academically, socially, or emotionally as their peers. Every one of us grows at different rates, and it doesn't mean that some kids are behind. Rather, it's our expectations and our system that needs to adapt. Without a doubt, it's challenging work to design and create the kind of learning experiences that honor and foster each child's individual growth. But with leaders like Christy forging our path forward, if there's one thing we're certain of, it's that the future is bright. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Bright, stories of hope and innovation in Michigan classrooms. This podcast is produced by Herbie Gaylord, is hosted by me, Nikki Herta, and is shaped by many of our passionate and talented colleagues. Big thanks to Kristen DeBruyler, Ann Perez, Ann Kraft, and Brandon Batista for their contributions to this episode. The Bright podcast is made possible by Michigan Virtual, a nonprofit organization that's leading and collaborating to build learning environments for tomorrow. Education is changing faster than ever. Discover new models and resources to move learning forward at your school at michiganvirtual.org.